Treaty was made in Fort Bridger. All our people went over there and camped and talked about where they was going to pick their reservation. So they talked about it and smoked a pipe and talked about it and, and uh, may well. This is. Uh, it's too windy up there where, where they was talking around Piney and all that. And then they oh, come around that way, around Jackson Hole and through there, and they say, oh, too much snow. We don't want to be there. Well, how about the place where we always camp and a lot of game there? A lot of game, fish. Why can't we... Uh, uh, Go there. Well, that's a place. They called it Warm Valley. There was no states then. There was no states. Good place to winter. This is a beautiful place to winter. Uh, even even Chief Waskey recognized this before the treaty. He wanted this area. He this is the area that he wanted the Wind River Valley because on account of the mild winters, and uh, and the ranchers have picked up on that too. And if a person is in agriculture, the water is basically their livelihood because in this country, without the water, you could raise absolutely nothing. To my culture, it's really important. We use it and pray for it and use it in a good way. Water, yeah, well, it's, it's pure and simple to me. We develop the arid lands of the West for the people of the nation to produce to feed people, to create recreation. Uh, that's justifiable in my way of thinking. I think it should take precedence over the fisheries. Water in the West, as the old cattle baron surely knew, and as anybody else has known, is the key to everything, that you can have lots of land, and if you don't have water, you haven't got much. Fighting over land, that's important consequential, but it's the fights over water that really are about 10 or 20 times more consequential. We've been involved with the water rights issue since, well, for 20 years now, if you, can, if you can believe that, since 1977. And the state of Wyoming at that time was claiming all the waters within, their, within the boundaries of the state and wanted to adjudicate finally and forever what water rights the Shoshone and Arapaho tribes were entitled to and what water rights the state was entitled to in the, in the Wind River Basin. And from then on, everything deteriorated. They caused hard feelings amongst neighbors, they caused hard feelings between the state and the tribes, and it has never been settled yet. You know, when I bought my farm on this project, I was a young fellow and full of energy. If I would have known how the Indians felt about us farming on the reservation, I would have never considered investing in this country. But I've got a lifetime invested in this, in the, in this project
before this land was opened up was all Indian land. This was opened up for homesteading. And when it was opened up for homesteading, basically the government took it and let homesteaders come in on it. And now the government has committed themselves to us. And the tribes feel like they've been cheated. Probably part of the thing is the government's ruined quite a few of the Indians because they've had a lot of handouts for them to where other people can't get a hold of. We are the managing agency for the Bureau of Reclamation. Problem is, farmers themselves can't do big projects. That's the reason that the Bureau of Reclamation was set up in the first place. The individuals can't handle these massive jobs, but the government can. Okay, and if it's a benefit to the people, okay, it's a good way for the government to spend you and our money. Well, the Bureau of Reclamation was originally the Reclamation Service, and it was established in the federal government in 1902 before that, John Wesley Powell, the explorer of the Colorado River, had been promoting irrigation in the West. But it was he who really began to collect a group of, of spirited young guys who wanted to go out and help turn the desert into an agricultural homelands for Eastern people who lacked farmlands, who wanted homes, who wanted to come out and carry on the old American uh, tradition. And in a way, the Reclamation Service carried that spirit at the beginning. I mean, it became a formula. You build a dam as the, the sort of foundation for economic development. And the purpose finally becomes total control for, this is a slogan the Bureau uses, total control for greater wealth. We will manage every river in the West, you know, from headwaters to the mouth, through massive irrigation projects. Who's entitled to the water? The project was here, it was in place, it demands so much water. I honestly truly believe that uh, this, the water is in the state of Wyoming. Why shouldn't it be the state's water? You know, obviously the tribes have been here long before the state, and there was there been tribal operating governments long before the state of Wyoming came into existence as a government. And much of the much of federal Indian law comes from those from the original treaties and the recognition of sovereignty between the tribes, various tribes, and and the United States government. And according to the Constitution. Uh of Wyoming, which uh, came in after the 1868 treaty. Uh, they, they claim all the water in the state. Well, how can you come in after somebody else is already in place and, you know, by treaty of 1868 and then come in in 1890 and say you claim all the water or you own all the water? This process is so much easier if you have a cultural understanding that tells you that the other party really does not substantively exist. So as you converge on the resource, if you don't even notice that you're converging, or if you are so certain of your own legitimacy and the uh, marginality, the peripheralness of the other guy, that really makes the process a lot easier. Prior appropriation doctrine is, is uh, the, the adage is sort of first in time, first in right. Yeah. Wyoming adopted that principle at statehood under our Constitution. Every use of water in the state of Wyoming requires a water right. Uh, you can't build a reservoir, towns can't use water, can't irrigate land without first having a water right. The only way you do that in Wyoming is to first come to the state engineer's office, the agency that, that I'm the head of, and my agency is the one who reviews and approves water rights. Once you have your water right, then you're, that entitles you to go out and develop your dam or irrigate your land, whatever it is you want to do. And the value of that system obviously is as long as there is plenty of water in the stream system uh, to satisfy all the water rights, um, then uh, um, everyone gets to use the benefit uh, of their water right. But as the stream flow drops in the late summer, the appropriation doctrine system guarantees that the first um, water users, the first people who appropriated water, continue to get their amount of water first 
And if there is still water left over, then the guy who has the second appropriation gets his amount of water, second, and, uh, and so on down the line until the water is all, uh, all being used. Western water law discourages conservation and efficient use of water. User or loser, right? So you got these non-Indians out there taking as much as they can, and they're, they're, they're destroying land, they're destroying water quality, they're altering the hydrologic cycle of our areas, and they're mismanaging water. We're wasting water every day. A lot of people, again, uh, depending on who you're talking to, will tell you that, uh, that Wyoming law allows irrigators to just run amok, um, to divert the streams dry and take as much water as they want. Um, again, those, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that theory or that concept uh, is, you know, demonstrates a lack of understanding of, of the way the law works. It's not uncommon for on, on any given day during the months of July and August and into early September see 90 to 95 and as high as 98 percent of the total water being dewatered in that stretch of river. There's been times when we've been out there and documented it, that uh, the river has been completely dry. And in the lower Wind, Wind River, even prior to getting to Riverton Valley, uh, fish that during those months, riffles become barriers and pools become death traps to a lot of fish. Well, we've got fish that are, that are completely eliminated in much of the lower Wind River. There's minnow species that are completely eliminated uh, from the system in that lower stretch. Well, now that area I grew up in, and because of all of the dewatering and chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides and everything else that comes into that river, the Big One River below the Diversion Dam is a dying river. It's, it's your right to divert. That's what the state looks like. It looks at it like. And to me, it just makes sense. Your right to divert this much water. Okay, are you putting it to beneficial use? Well, what's beneficial use? Uh, agriculture, livestock, and domestic. What other use could, you know, what, it, what would be unbeneficial, you know? There's a lot more beneficial uses of water than just irrigation. How can it just be for irrigation? And there's a heck of a lot more people that are interested in water, not only for irrigation, but for all the other uses. And why wouldn't you want to do that? I think if there was any one single thing that just accentuated the total injustice associated with um, the system and the way the tribes have been treated, it's Diversion Dam. It's a low head dam that was built by uh, the Bureau of Reclamation in 1934, which extends the entire width of the river that uh, prevents fish movements and migration upstream and downstream. As soon as that diversion dam was built, uh, large amounts of sediment started building up uh, behind the dam. And it became the practice of the day, I guess, to uh, just open up the dam every once in a while and flush those sediments downstream. And that's been going on for decades. The irrigators can take out the clean water that has flown in the system until the sediment builds up uh, to a point where it's starting to leach into the irrigation ditch. And then they dump the sediment on the Indian Reservation and take their clean water. Imagine if the fish had already spawned and they spawn in fine gravels and they deposit their eggs in four to six inches of gravel. Well, imagine them doing that right after a sluice. Uh, what kind of survival do you think is going to happen? It's having a very major impact down the entire length of the river. People living in Riverton 40, 50 years ago or more would, would routinely fish in Riverton and, and catch a variety of fish that they don't, they're just not there now. There's been a concern about the silt in the river for quite a few years. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife have complained about it constantly, you know. People would like to, th they don't understand water hydraulics is, and that's where these, this, this bad PR comes from. You, it's just something that you have to do if you're going to divert water. 
here you have a river that could be scenic, it could be fishable, it could be floatable, it could have all the attributes that all major rivers have, and this one doesn't have it. I believe this, that the tribes could manage water better than the state engineer on this reservation. For Indian people, our sovereignty, our religion, our culture, our way of life, our ceremonies, our, our beliefs, it all ties in, it all ties in together. Our beliefs and our cultural and traditional attachment with water is what sets our Federal Indian Reserve water rights apart from a regular state appropriated water right. The Indian water right is, is a species of a reserved water right, i.e. the uh, uh, federal government can, with respect to any federal lands, national forest, what have you, they can claim they have reserved a water right that is consistent with the reservation of the land. The tribes uh, were looking to avail themselves of this other legal doctrine because that would allow them to improve the priority date. Uh, that would allow them to uh, quantify and establish water rights which would carry the date of the reservation. In 1977 the general adjudication got started. We went through years of, of, of litigation uh, ultimately resulting in a, in a 1985 decision uh, which is where uh, the state courts in Wyoming did award reserved water rights to the Wind River Indian Reservation. If you talk to other water users um, in the basin who, who thought they had good water rights with a 1900 priority date, they now find themselves, instead of equal or maybe even ahead of some of these projects on the reservation, they're now 40 years later than the reservation. There was a lot of alarm, a lot of concern that maybe somebody was going to shoot somebody. That it, you know, you heard the heard the thing. If if somebody, if the tribes come out to turn off my head gate, they're gonna have they're gonna meet me with my rifle. It basically wasn't a good feeling for the water users. They uh, seemed to think they should have their water when they need it, when we needed it the worst. And the rest of them, they didn't care about it at all. I think the worst thing that ever hit this country was Richard Baldez. He was kind of a thorn in everybody's side. He worked for the Fish and Wildlife. He gave us a lot of problems and everybody else. Midville had a lot of problems with him. He was kind of a one-man band, I guess you'd say. I think that uh, they have blinders on. I mean, much more even than most of us have blinders on. They've been able to, to get all the water that they've ever wanted for all of these years. And then finally someone is saying, wait a minute, you know, there's there's a lot of other uses of, of, of water in the Wind River and the, and the the whole Wind River drainage other than irrigation. In 1985, the Shoshone and Arapaho tribes adopted a tribal water code. And when we adopted our tribal water code, um, we almost started WW3. You know, there are all of the uh, non-Indians in the country went bonkers on us. The governor and the state water engineer were going goofy on us because they say, oh, them Indians are going to burn us out, them Indians are going to dry us out, them Indians are going to destroy the economy, them Indians are acting up again. And the first thing they did was to issue some sort of a water right under their own laws for in-stream flow. They wanted to dedicate a block of their water for a certain stretch of the Wind River, which was downstream from a, a series of major diversion canals, uh, primarily that served non-Indian land, and there just wasn't the water there. In other words, we would have had to uh, turn off a lot of people to, to uh, sort of recognize this in-stream flow water right. People have come to recognize, primarily because of depleted rivers, that there, there has to be a provision in the law to allow uh, for aquatics, to allow for a river uh, not to, 
totally dry up and, and, and kill the system. What we're trying to do with in-stream flows and, and maintain a decent flow in the Wind River benefits all people. It benefits the irrigators, it benefits the tribes, it benefits the fishermen, it benefits uh, floaters, it benefits people that want to just take pictures, it benefits the people that live along the river. Well, wouldn't it be a hell of a lot better if there was water in the river than, rather than a dry stream bed? If they can use the water, fine. I think they should use it. But just running it down the river here is beneficial to nobody. That's not putting it to beneficial use. To impact somebody else for the fish, it's a little hard for me to understand why I should do that. What is that fish, you know, what is that value? To waste the resources means to let the water run to the sea unused, to let um, a tribe have possession of a rich territory. There's a, just a very comfortable benefit that comes from seeing Indians as not ever having put the resources to the right use and therefore having forfeited any claim. What I was seeing was, um, was a hope and a desire and a belief uh, by the tribal government at that time that they were going, they were one step closer to self-sufficiency uh, and that there was a synergy involved, there was a uh, glint in their eye that they were going to be able to restore uh, a watershed and a river system to something that mimicked uh, what it once was. My mother would cut us a, a willow pole and we put a short fishing line on the end of it and a hook and, and worms and we would dangle that in the river and catch uh, uh, mostly flat, uh, flathead chub. But at that time there was lots and lots of them. And that fish has essentially disappeared from the, from the Wind River in this area. But more significant was the sauger and the ling burbot, the freshwater cod, which are both extremely important uh, fish species to the, to the Native Americans that live on the reservation. The ling burbot is probably more important than, than the trout species are. If we had consistent flows year after year after year, we may see more resident fish uh, setting up shop in that area. And we're not just talking about fish, we're talking about bringing the, the Wind River back. We're talking about ground water we charge, we're talking about wetlands, we're talking about repairing habitat, we're talking about a lot of areas uh, for both fish and wildlife along the wind. You know, whether it's right or wrong, um, that, uh, that Wyoming was not in the in-stream flow game back in 1890, um, the fact is uh, those water rights that, that grew up on the stream system as Wyoming uh, grew up as a state, um, uh, pretty much did everything that they were supposed to do. But I don't think anybody is just going to go go tell some irrigator or farmer with a 1902 or a 1906 or a 1910 priority, sorry, we need your water for an in-stream flow. The tribes do have a uh, 1868 water right, which is the oldest and best in Wyoming. Uh, but they got to put it. It's got to be managed according to the state code. The engineer, state engineer, Jeff Fassett, says this is how we manage the water in the state of Wyoming and you will do the same. That's the part they don't like. Their philosophy of uh, Jeff Fassett and, and uh, the state of Wyoming, theirs isn't any different than the irrigators. The, the water here is for the irrigators. And from a tribal standpoint, I mean, th that's not even a consideration. It's like the two tribes, Shoshone and Arapaho, don't exist. Denying the water is not the issue, it's whether the water right to protect the river is a, is a legal, legally protected right. The issue is a jurisdictional issue as to who makes those decisions and how do you go about making that decision. Instream flow could be considered a four-letter word for Western, Western water rights because agriculture has the lock on Western water. And any time uh, any entity, whether it's a tribe or even a non-Indian irrigator, if they want to transfer use of water from the beneficial use of agriculture to another beneficial use, that's, that, that's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough task. And they don't even do it for non-Indian, so how do you expect them to do it for Indian people, right? Neither one's going to give up the jurisdiction. And if you ask each other to, they will litigate to protect sovereignty as much as the state of Wyoming will 
litigate to protect our sovereignty as well. The case came to us because of the desire of the tribes to develop a fishery concept with the maintenance of an in-stream flow. And dealing with that, uh, our court by a majority concluded that the reservation essentially had been established as a, an agricultural and economic environment. And so that the reserved rights were the rights that would be consistent with agricultural use in stream flow to maintain a fishery was not consistent with that sort of right. Since we restricted them to agriculture, that, 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 that m makes sense that we shouldn't allow them to have in-stream flow because we agree that it's an agricultural reservation. Anyway, that was his rationale pretty much, you know. For them to be convinced that in this day and age, the only reason this reservation was created for agriculture, you know, just kind of blows, you, blows me away. Especially here in Wyoming and, and in this part of the country, that's a pretty sad com commentary on how, how, how Indian rights have progressed and Indian issues have progressed in this day and age. It was an attempt, and, and a very good one on the part of the Supreme Court justices, to, uh, to avoid um, uh, you know, a, a war in this space. And I think that the, the justices recognized very clearly um, the potential for, uh, uh, you know, for an uprising uh, in, this, in this valley, and I think they um, astutely uh, uh, <laughs> diverted from that. It seems highly unlikely that anybody's going to build dams and irrigation projects to irrigate what sort of are sagebrush flats at the moment. It just doesn't make sense. So what we have is a situation in which the tribes have the right to a tremendous amount of water that they have no way to utilize. Here we have indigenous tribes that basically have all of what we now call the United States of America, and uh, 200 years later, they don't have very much of it. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the other side of that coin is, well, that's what happens to you when you lose. <laughs>
And I think this is very much true of irrigated agriculture. That is, you can sustain this for a little while at great public cost and investment, um, but the economic factors and the environmental factors just keep increasing to the point that it becomes totally irrational to try to sustain this in many places. Look at the river, it still dries up every year. There still isn't in stream flows. State's still controlling all the water. And the irrigators are taking all of the all the water that they want. I think there are a lot of people who would really like to see the river a lot, see a thriving river in that part, in that stretch of river. And uh, you know, some people think it's a shame that it that it's the way it is. But I think overriding all of that is the fact that uh, this community has its roots in agriculture, and. Uh, uh, the majority of people don't want to see that economic base jeopardized in any way. You know, my brother, he was, uh, he's on a mining board someplace in Colorado, and he's telling me the other day, there's only two things in this world that generate, that keeps the people going. And he said, you either grow it or you mine it. There's nothing else. There's nothing else here. So in Zotzawana, that's what I was saying.